Welcome, everybody. This is the first invited lectureship of 24. Um, thank you to the spine surgeons, the physiatry people, the neurology faculty who came. Um, and uh, today I'm going to ask Dr. Vitali Sioman to introduce Dr. Benzel because Dr. Benzel was one of Vitt's professors when he trained at Cleveland Clinic. Vitt? <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, it's not just one of the professors, it's the professor. And uh, I'll just go over the formal introduction. And uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's an honor and a privilege, Dr. Benzel. Uh, and uh, back in the day, it was just a lot of fun to, to be with you in the operating room. It's uh, it always whenever we would scrub, Dr. Benzel will take you through the case with enthusiasm. It was always a great educational opportunity. Uh, and uh, it, it was just not only education, it was always a lot of fun and uh, and uh, a lot of uh, information, a lot of knowledge. It's just a walking encyclopedia of everything. Um, so Dr. Benzel was born in Spokane, Washington. He received his chemical engineering degree from Washington State University. And then his uh, MD from Medical College of Wisconsin in 1975. He then continued his training in neurosurgery and then neurosurgical fellowship in Wisconsin, completing studies in 1981. Uh, then he became chief of neurosurgery at Louisiana State University uh, before moving to the University of New Mexico, where he was uh, chief of neurosurgery from uh, uh, 89 to 99. During this time frame, he established a neurosurgery residency training program and a spine fellowship. He then moved to Cleveland Clinic to become the director of spinal disorders and uh, has continued his career uh, there since. He has been chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery until 2017. He is known amongst his neurosurgical colleagues as the engineer amongst spinal deformity neurosurgeons. He has a very conservative and prag pragmatic approach to neurosurgery for disorders of the spinal column. He has given more than 200 invited lectures, authored and uh, edited 35 books, authored 376 book chapters, uh, and 254 peer-reviewed papers and 328 abstracts. And as an educator, he has been honored with six teaching awards. Uh, the list of honors for the spinal neurosurgery career are lengthy, but include the Pioneer of Spine Surgery Award at the North American Spine Society, uh, the World Federation of Neurosurgeons, uh, William Beecher's uh, Scoville uh, Prize in 2011, the Outstanding Contributors uh, to a Medical Science Worldwide Award and the Brazilian Congress of Spine Surgery uh, in 2013. He was the honored guest uh, of the Congress of Neurological Surgeons in 2014, and he made a special private presentation to President George W. Bush on spinal sensor technology in 2007. He, was uh, he has educated over 100 residents and fellows, held 18 grants and 11 medical, uh, uh, medical uh, patents. His service uh, for uh, uh, organized neurosurgery spans four pages on his 159-page curriculum vitae. I, I'm, I'm done reading. It's very impressive. All right, so uh, we'll all welcome Dr. Benzel. I am uh, truly humbled by your comments. Um, Vitt's always been a favorite. Um, residency's tough, and he went through it like uh, nobody's business. And I've heard from so many, so many people here, how uh, well you are doing it. Like I told Dr. McDermott, it just gives me goosebumps. Thank you. So I was asked to talk about something, and I said, you know, how about cervical myelopathy and cervical spondylosis? And then um, I said to Mike last night, I says, I could throw in a little biomechanics. And he says, no. Eh, nah. <laughs> and so I said, how about, uh, this is actually not in the same order, but how about uh, talk about talking about artificial discs. And so I'm going to do that a little bit after I finish with the talk on spinal uh, on cervical spondylosis. Uh, cervical spondylotic myelopathy is a manifestation of encroachment and tethering and repetitive trauma. So the spinal cord is stretched, pounded on, et cetera, repetitively, causing it to gradually deteriorate. Um, Okay.
These are all patients with a cervical spondylosis. Anybody have any guesses as to what the two major complaints for every single one of these patients is? Neck pain. And I'll tell you the next one in a second. Let's start with neck pain. The patient's spine is bent forward. The spinal cord is usually being comp uh, compressed. And we see this kyphosis trapezius sign. This is where the patient uh, is trying to correct the deformity, uh, but cannot and cannot get it done with the normal erector spinae muscles. And so uh, the uh, trapezius muscles are reflexively activated. Okay, they're not positioned well to accomplish the task and henceforth, the patient ends up with a myofascial pain syndrome. The second one is back pain. Why do they have back pain? Well, this patient, for some reason that I'm not entirely sure of, had this occiput to thoracic fusion. And unfortunately, it, uh, it took. Um, and this is what she stuck with. She was fused looking downward. Okay, so what does she have to do? If you look at this x-ray, you see that the plumb line, which should be falling in line with the vertebral bodies, is falling way behind the vertebral bodies. So the patient is stressing the spine in extension, and almost all these patients will have back pain associated with their neck pain. This is even a better example. You can see the kyphosis here, and the extended spine here, and the trapezius sign, kyphosis trapezius sign here. So a lot of these patients are infirm, um, not healthy, frail. Um, and so we need to try non-operative strategies if possible. Obviously, postural strategies will work, uh, potentially, uh, causing the patient's neck to us extend. Um, keep in mind that this patient with ankylosing spondylitis on the right side uh, spent a lot of his time in bed on his back with a pillow because it felt better to have his head flexed with the pillow, and this is his punishment. Now we have biologics and understand this process better, but in the day, uh, there were a lot of these people running around. So we can also work with a variety of strengthening exercises, and although I have never seen a patient in uh, images improve, or the angles improve. I've had a number of patients improve clinically with regard to those two strategies of uh, strengthening and stretching. So there are a number of surgical strategies. We know that if we can keep the spine straightened and extended in normal lordosis, the patients have a lot better uh, outcome from a quality of life respected. Um, I'm going to show you a grave mistake I made, and I show this a lot to continuously remind myself and burn her images into my heart because I did this lady no favor. Uh, here she is. She has a cervical myelopathy, um, and this is her post-op x-ray. So what's wrong with the post-op x-ray? Her spine is straightened. I didn't this I did this case years and years ago, and I didn't really appreciate this as much. Um, but this is one of the earlier, not the earliest steps on the journey that I'm going to speak about today. Um, and so when we do fuse, we need to make sure we fuse them in the proper position with normal alignment. There are a variety of strategies to try to deal with this. Uh, one of them is to just simply, um, loosen up the Mayfield tongs, uh, Mayfield uh, head holder, and then straighten out the spine, rehook it up again, come back later and extend it some more, rehook it up again. But it's very difficult to do that. Um, and when I keep coming back, say several times, uh, what am I, what principle am I taking advantage of? Th that principle is viscoelasticity. The change in, sh in, in uh, shape of a body uh, at the uh, because of the uh, presentation of a constant load. So we can use tables that have tongs like this 
Gardner Wells tongue right here hooked into the patient um, and can pull upwards constantly. I've only done this a couple of times and it scared me to death. Because if these tongs rip out, and I think we all of us have used them, know that they can rip out. Uh, there's not uh, a, a, a lot of a lot from keeping the patient from being injured. You can see we have this little fail safe here, um, but that's sort of feeble. Here's another shot. So bottom line is when we are treating cervical spondylotic myelopathy, we need to focus on deformity. Why? We can manage neck pain. We can treat myelopathy. We can decrease end fusion degenerative changes and more on that later. We can improve short and long-term success. Um, intraoperative uh, vent uh, deformity correction can be done ventrally and dorsally. And I've already made the statement that it's easier to do from a ventral approach than from a dorsal approach. But regardless of the strategies used, it's all about leverage. Here's some of the ventral techniques. We can use cast bar pins to uh, straighten uh, or extend the spine. Um, we can use an intermediate point of fixation to bring the bone to the implant, thus further extending the spine. Here's an example of that. And so we convert a kyphosis or a, a kyphosis to a lordosis. And here we see that. Uh, and we can use gravity. And the viscoelasticity principle arises here again, uh, gradual deformation in response to a constant load. So this is a patient I took care of around the turn of the century. Um, it's sad to say I've been around that long. Um, but um, she had had multiple operations. Um, she was 68 years old. Uh, I don't know if she had the kyphosis trapezius sign because I wasn't looking for it then. Um, so this is a journey that I took. Um, but I did, did know that she needed to be straightened out. So this is her, her MRI. Um, again, there's some things that I just didn't dawn on me at this time with this particular patient, but she had these signal changes in her spinal cord. But what's unique about this position or about this image is that she has ventral and dorsal patent subarachnoid space. So why would she have an injury to her spinal cord there? Um, uh, I knew I could correct her ventrally because her facets weren't ankylosed. And I apologize for some of these images, but they're old. Uh, and notice how she opened up below the level of her fusion. And I fused her in this position. Um, but I used this, I used all these techniques. I have a donut under her head. Um, and I'm doing the relaxing procedures, the discectomies, et cetera. And then uh, using cast bar pins to put in maybe one or two of the, of the uh, struts. And then I take this uh, donut from beneath her head and let her head go backwards. The head weighs about 10 pounds and you can apply a constant load by just letting it, it at first it was suspended. It was not ask the anesthesiologist, is the head on the table? No. 20 minutes later, is it on the table? Yes. So gradually correct the deformity. Correcting cervical deformities, in my opinion, often requires a lot of patience on the part of the surgeon. And here we are doing these things. And here's her correction from a 15 degree lordos uh, kyphosis to a five degree uh, lordosis. Now, is this ideal? No, but getting more may have been too costly. And she did exceedingly well. She began improving with regard to her myelopathy. And you say, why? She didn't really have any compression. Um, um, and uh, I, I could have done her all prone and adjusted the head holder, but I would have to uh, be very careful. It, regardless, fixation follows. And here she is uh, after that operation. And again, I could have done, rather than multiple level discectomies, I could have done multiple level corpectomies and a posterior fusion, because you need those intermediate points of fixation, and I'll go over that later. But um, that's two operations. Remember, these people aren't the healthiest people in the world. And so I brought the bone to the implant, et cetera, and here she is post-op. So don't count on intramedullary signal changes going away after you decompress them. But 
These went away. Now, why in the world, I might ask myself 25 years ago, didn't, did they go away? And why were they there in the first place? I think the, uh, the uh, reason for all of this is going to become abundantly clear here if you already haven't figured it out. Shortly thereafter, this also 68-year-old male from Puerto Rico came to see me. Ten years prior, he had a cervical laminectomy. And now he's got a progressive myelopathy, um, and his MRI looks like this. So his surgeon sends him to me and says, well, you know, what's going on here? I got an MRI that looks good, um, and it's a little atrophy of the spinal cord, but it doesn't explain this progressive myelopathy. So um, I know, I, I, I knew at that time, that cervical spondylotic myelopathy was a manifestation of repetitive trauma and tethering and distraction. If I just go back a second, there doesn't appear to be any tethering or distraction here. But if I get a flexion x-ray, I see that there's a lot of motion. She, he can only extend to the extent that he can on the, on the left image. And on the right image, he can flex quite a bit, which means all the facet joints are open. They're just sort of jammed by osteophytes. Um, so I got a flexion MRI scan. This is, I believe, the first dynamic um, uh, MRI of the cervical spine at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, I, there, somebody else could have ordered one, but I, I, I don't know. So basically, he inflection is really traumatizing his spinal cord. Well, we knew, uh, here's the neutral or extended one on the left and the flexed MRI on the right. So now this is becoming much more common, use, commonly used and be careful because you don't want the patient to be in the MRI scanner and then go paralyzed because you have them in a compromised position. So the texts have to be instructed and, and uh, familiar with the procedure. I knew I could correct him dorsally because all I had to do is unjam the facet joints, which means to do uh, facet osteotomies at each level, um, which means basically staying dorsal to the nerve root and going all the way out, not 99% of the way out, but all the way out on both sides. Um, and looking at preoperative imaging studies for evidence of an aberrant uh, vertebral artery. Just have to make sure if we're going out into that territory that we've covered all bases. And so I did that. Um, and you can see these facet osteotomies here. Unfortunately, my videos aren't working that I want to show later. Um, at any rate, you can see the facet joints. And I don't know why my arrow, here we go. This is a facet osteotomy right here. It's all the way out. So here she is. We, uh, uh, he is. We did him from C3 to T1 or 2, T2. Um, I, I made a mistake that I will not make again, is, is that I went to C3 rather than taking it to T2. But again, it's been a long learning curve for me um, because you lose very little motion and you gain a lot of traction. In other words, good fixation and you can hold the sw spine back. So here he, here's him slipping forward and his surgeon in Puerto Rico fixed him. Just note that this C23 angle is not horizontal to the floor. This is an important parameter, at least in my hands. And so he fused him in this position, and he was very happy, even though he isn't, he's not uh, anatomical, he's uh, stable. And so uh, things ended up good for him. Okay, life goes on. About three or four or five years later, I have this 32-year-old gentleman who uh, was involved in a motor vehicle accident and who developed a C7-T1 herniated disc. He was treated by a surgeon at, of course, St. Elsewhere with this uh, device that the surgeon took out and then he, um, he put it back together. He got it from the surgeon and put it back together. Unfortunately, when you want somebody to not fuse they fuse. And so he fused in this position. He is not myelopathic. 
He simply got neck pain or the trapezius kyphosis sign. And you can see here is on the upper left, his, um, he is not compressed, but you can see his neck muscles, the trapezius muscles are uh, hypertrophied and he's leaning backwards. He also has back pain. So here's a much better example of facet osteotomies. You can see how the facets have been drilled out all the way through. And so we drilled through the old fusions and the facet joints and then flipped him over and did multiple level discectomies and instrumented fusion. We brought the bone to the implant. We used a viscoelasticity by the donut technique. And one other thing that I haven't mentioned, we used trapezoidal fibular allograft struts. So here he is pre-op. And around this time, operating on somebody for neck pain was sort of taboo um, and still is probably appropriately so for the, for the most part, but not every case. So sometimes it's more appropriate to correct at another level. This lady has neurofibromatosis, duralectasia, um, and has had multiple uh, uh, upper cervical operations. And she's basically got an ear on shoulder deformity with the ectatic blood vessels, et cetera. Um, and here she is pre-op. Um, so we took her to the operating room and fundamentally what we were dealing with here, and I'd never tell an insurance carrier this, was a cosmetic operation because she was miserable because she couldn't get a date. Or, and uh, we fixed that. Um, so we got her position on the table. I started doing the facetectomies, as you can see here. Um, right here is where the big one was. And then I went down, uh, broke scrub, went down and put her head in the position we wanted it in. And then um, we finished the osteotomies. And when I got through the one that I just pointed at, there was a pop, a crack, and a sudden movement. So that's unnerving. Um, and the patient has to be aware, if you're going to really fix this deformity, that there could be a vertebral artery injury. So we were as ready as we could be for that. And fortunately, we didn't have it. And the, the x-ray report for this construct was pretty impressive. They, they couldn't understand where all these screws and everything were. But as a surgeon, we need to take advantage that's the, of the anatomy that's given to us. Our job is not to make this look pretty. It's to be functional. And she was exceedingly happy after all of this. Here she is with a little thoracic scoliosis, which could have contributed to her upper cervical problems. Sometimes you don't want to do the entire operation at the same setting. This is a patient with progressive neck pain, um, progressive myelopathy, and this finding on MRI. Here she is with CT, and she, you can see that she's had multiple, multiple operations. Um, and there was a very good reason we didn't want to operate on her from in front. Um, and so we said, we need to do this from behind. And we took her to the operating room, did laminectomies and facetectomies, and said, I don't think we got any. I mean, I just don't know if we've gotten enough correction. And we couldn't see down below C2 because of her size. And this is in the day before uh, O-arm. And so we really had no imaging. And so we put to close the wound, put her in the ICU, put her in gentle traction with a little roll under her shoulder, got a CT scan, and we said, we'll take this. And so we put her in this position in surgery and did this operation. We took this, I believe, down to T3 or T4. She's got a heavier than normal head um, and um, got, or maybe even further, and got a great uh, correction. Um, this, these are movies that are not working, and I, I apologize for that, but here is that facetectomy I was talking about. Just got to make sure that the vertebral artery is not in an aberrant position. So 
she she was a happy camper. She actually lost some weight for a while and then gained it back. So let's talk about the C23 angle, something else we've learned along, along the path. Um, if we, uh, this is a paper we published in 2018. If we uh, look at a angle that's steep, in other words, the C23 angle should be horizontal in the standing position, should be horizontal to the floor in a, in a normal person. If it's tilted like this, um, then we end up with a statistically higher reoperation rate, pseudoarthrosis rate, progressive kyphosis rate, an adjacent segment disease and degeneration rate. It wasn't even close. So working on that C23 angle is exceedingly important. The other angle is the is the sake of the uh, uh, thrust uh, C C T C seven T one slope or T one slope. Um, it tells us something different. The two three the two three angle tells us in the operating room whether we've got enough correction. The C seven T one angle that we see here tells us whether how how far down we need to go in the thoracic spine and how much of a correction do we need at the cervical thoracic junction because this look at this look at her she's this patient has a basically an upper cervical lordosis but yet has a horrible sva um, uh, sagittal vertical axis in other words sagittal ver vertical axis is if you take a, a a line straight down at c2 and at c7 or t1 it's the dis different how far it measures how far the patient is leaning forward. So the C23 angle has intraoperative utility. So this is a person who we would theoretically want to get into this position, but we this is the same patient I had before. Um, and we know that if we correct a th cervical thoracic deformity, um, we can correct this angle at the same time. So here's a patient I've already mentioned to some of you how I just love operating on redos. So, but this is a patient who's had lumbar surgery and multiple cervical operations uh, and is miserable with the kyphosis trapezius sign and, uh, and, uh, and back pain. But the back pain, she comes nat naturally here with her old lumbar fusion. So what do we see that's wrong here? Um, well, she's leaning forward. And so we're going to correct her deformity and do facet osteotomies and extend her. And so we use the C23 angle to determine when we've got enough correction. So you take if you take the picture on the left and then just simply turn it 90 degrees to the left, you can see what she would look like if she were standing. And so the C23 angle is pretty good. It's pretty close to being horizontal with the floor. And so we'll take that. So we're done with that. And here she is um, after the surgery. And so I, I, another thing that I think is really important for the spine surgeons here is getting scoliosis x-rays when you don't think you might not necessarily need them. And I'll show you a couple examples why I think that's the case. We need to know how patients are stacked up um, because make no mistake, the cervical spine affects the thoracic and lumbar spine and vice versa. At any rate, here are her angles. Her plumb line um, it passes right where it's supposed to, uh, from, from T1 down through the lumbosacral junction. <clears throat> but this is pre-op, um, but her, uh, her C23 angle is tilted. This is probably where most of her pain is gen generated from. Post-op, um, C23 angle is horizontal to the floor. Right here. And the plumb line has now gone from a normal position to an abnormal, abnormal position. It's moved forward. Why did it do that? This is probably her intrinsic normal posture at this with given everything that's going on and with the film on the left 
she was trying to, she was standing up, but she's supposed to be looking forward. So what's she doing? Leaning backwards. It's a total pathological positioning of her. And so now she's more comfortable while having a less than optimal uh, position of the plumb line. So I, I had, had this patient um, who was a 34-year-old so male with a small fiber neuropathy, and he was miserable. Kind of a little bit of a chronic pain, but for the most part, uh, seemed like a relative straight shooter. Um, and I had multiple po partners tell me that you cannot fix this by just fusing the upper cervical spine. And I said, let me give it a try. So here is his spine. Um, and this is sort of a neuropathic uh, degeneration and deformation of his spine. Um, and here is him laying comfortably on a on an, on an MRI table. So he's got a little compression. So we wanted to decompress him down lower. Um, and this is his uh, scoliosis view. So this deformity in the cervical spine affects all levels, including the lumbar spine. So we did a C4 and upper C5 laminectomy, C4-5 bilateral foraminotomies, and the C2-5 to five instrumented fusion. We did not take it to the thoracic spine, which my partners would have, and I'm glad to say they were wrong. So here he is. And why did I know I could do this? Because he's young. We hardly ever operate on a young spine that's mobile. We're operating on a 70-year-old or an 80-year-old whose spine is rigid, and you could never get this kind of correction from this approach in that patient. But in this patient, we did. And he was one of the most uh, grateful patients I have taken care of. So here's his neck. Now here's his, uh, his scoliosis view. Um, and again, I'm a big fan of scoliosis views. You can see how his thoracic hump is diminished. He is much more, um, uh, his plumb line is lined up. He is, uh, a, there's a good reason for him to be uh, happy with his surgery. So um, we need to in, put patient spines in the right posture. Um, and this is a list of old literature. There's more coming out. Um, looking at um, the effects of an abnormal posture of a disc interspace, like in kyphosis, and, and how it affects adversely adjacent segments. Um, and so there's a lot of stress placed on adjacent levels by abnormal and anatomically placed um, spines. So uh, remember, uh, with the C23 angle, uh, Watch for, we have decreased reoperation rates if we correct it, decreased pseudoarthrosis rates, progressive prevent, progressive kyphosis. We see adjacent segment degeneration and disease. And so there's these two patients both had an ACDF. And the patient on the left presented later with adjacent segment disease. The patient on the right is not represented. So they both had a relief of their symptom, of their radicular symptoms, but there is a big difference in how their degenerate, how their spine degenerates. So I'd like to take that as a segue and spend 10 minutes and leave 10 minutes for discussion um, on total disc arthroplasty. Um, sort of a hot topic all over the country. When we talk about total disc, total disc arthroplasty, we want to know what kind of stresses are going to be incurred by the arthroplasty and by the adjacent segments and the same segment uh, that the arthroplasty is placed in. On the left, with a, a Charité disc, which is metal on poly, if we load the spine vertically, uh, there is, uh, it's infinitely stiff. Okay, that's not normal. On the other side of a coin, if we have a a disc as we see on the right side, which is a ball and socket joint, um, we have basically uh, no resistance to flexion extension and lateral bending. So mechanical neck pain or mechanical back pain is basically related to these graphs. And I won't go into them with great detail, but this is a stress strain curve. A to B 
is the neutral zone. It's very loose. I'm throwing in a little biomechanics, okay? <laughs> um, a to B is a little loose, uh, and that's the neutral zone. And so I apply very little force and get significant movement, okay? Once I get to this point, though, I have to apply much greater force to get a get movement, and the, that line from B to C is uh, called the uh, the elastic zone. And then, if I keep pushing it, this will eventually fail. So, if we're going to talk about mechanical back pain, um, mechanical back pain is deep and agonizing pain that is worsened with activity and improved with with unloading. Um, this is it, the red curve. The neutral zone is widened. The spine is more sloppy. And so therefore the patient needs to uh, uh, exert, uh, reflexively exert other forces to try to prevent that, which induce pain. So let's look at variety of artificial or disc, uh, spinal implants and talk about flexion and extension uh, and how, how they affect it. I already talked about the Charité really having a widened neutral zone because there is no uh, resistance to flexion, extension, lateral bending. And this, uh, the second disc is a Acroflex disc. It was made by Steffi and Acromed Company. Um, and it was one of the first of the polymeric discs. It failed because the polymer, or it was actually rubber, separated from the metal. And you might see some sort of a combined or a hybrid a curve. Um, most of you or a lot of you may be familiar with the Denesis system, which is the third one, which basically stiffened the spine. You'd think it could move the curve from the dotted line to the red line, and it probably does, but there's been no real good clinical evidence that it's effective. And finally, if you fuse the patient, you have a straight up curve, which is infinite stiffness. Now, if we're talking about axial loading, the Charité disc loads uh, significantly, it accepts loads significantly in axial loading and transmits those loads to above and below. Um, the the Acroflex disc does the same thing. Uh, no, no real comment about the last two. So uh, I just mentioned this, adjacent segments versus same, same segment stresses from, from a arthroplasty um, both are significant, um, and we really haven't adequately um, measured these and assessed these. Um, but I'd like to, so a lot of the data from, uh, from artificial discs is recent, by that I mean under 10 years or so. Um, um, but the data that we should have been looking at uh, to, to determine, I'm, I obviously have a bias here. Um, and it's food for thought. And I don't know what operation is best, an ACDF or an artificial disc. Um, but uh, I think we need better studies to prove that, to show that. At any rate, we look at Asian Jason segment degeneration, which is degenerative changes on imaging, or disease, which is symptomatic degenerative changes uh, with imaging. So I'd like to just take a whirlwind tour through old literature. Um, this is from um, 2004 by Hillebrand from the group at, uh, at, uh, in Philadelphia. Um, they did three studies with the average follow-up of 4.5 years where they looked at the prevalence of adjacent segment disease uh, following anterior cervical operations. And the annual incidence was about Five, uh, 3 percent per year. Just remember that number. Um, Henderson et al. from Minnesota in 1983 looked at laminal foramenotomies. Um, they did 846 of them, didn't follow them all for a long period of time. And a laminal foramenotomy, for those of you who do not know, <clears throat> do not know, is a simple way of decompressing a nerve root uh, without fusing or doing anything to the spine other than taking a little bone away and gaining access to the lateral recesses where the, where the stenosis is, is occurring. So they had a prevalence of 9% in 
and an annual incidence of adjacent segment disease in a patient they didn't fuse. It should be the ultimate uh, motion sparing operation uh, was about the same as the ACDF. Uh, Lunsford from Pittsburgh in 1980 looked at 253 patients with ACD with and without fusion. Um, they didn't notice any difference and they again saw 2.5% or 3% per year. And then the group from Philadelphia again, interestingly looked at single level and multiple level uh, ACDFs and fusions and found out that um, the multi-level ACDF had a lower incidence of adjacent segment disease than the single level. So that one's sort of difficult to, to sort out, but I am guessing that what they did was they had four, five, and five, six, and six, seven. And if they took an adjacent, if they took an adjacent segment with a multiple level operation, they were taking a vulnerable level out and so that it couldn't degenerate. So here's where my gripe is with the studies. All studies uh, for artificial discs are done by surgeons who do artificial disc operations. There's an intrinsic bias with that. There's an academic bias, vested interest, um, study design issues come into play, um, post-surgical decisions and whether to take a person back to surgery or not. Um, and then something that is talked about but I don't think addressed enough is the winner-loser bias. These studies were done when there was limited access to the artificial disc, and the only way a patient could get to it would be to have a uh, go into a study. And if they went into a study and they got alloc allocated to the fusion group, they were a loser. And if they were allocated to the artificial disc group, they were a winner. So again, I go back to what I think causes adjacent, accelerates DJ adjacent seg segment disease is uh, uh, deformity, segmental deformity. And we should focus, focus, focus on the management of segmental deformity. And remember this study with the C23 angle. If we don't have a normal uh, alignment, we have greater operations, reoperations, greater pseudoarthrosis rate, um, uh, progressive kyphoses, and adjacent segment degeneration and disease. I thank you very much. I would. <laughs> Uh, some of Ed's redos with those giant deformities remind me of shunt operations I would take on UCSF, like the loser cases that were yeah. very complicated. But it's right. If you stay with it, you can usually, and do the right thing, you can fix it. Um, Raul, do you have a question? Great talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I think how do, um, how do you deal with the... Uh, Patients that are poor host, a poor host, severely osteoporotic, or that are not suitable for, for a, this, uh, you know, for they have long fusion operation. Long fusion operation. Yeah, I mean, like like I said, um, I will go to these exercises and say, listen, you're not a candidate for surgery. It's just too much, um, and you know, you get some people begging you, mm -hmm. uh, and. You know, it's one thing if a chronic pain patient is begging you to do surgery and you know you're not going to. It's another another thing when somebody who you know you could possibly help with surgery is begging for it and you say no. Um, mm -hmm. But I think we need to do with it what's in reason. And I my answer to them is if you really um, want to get relief, the safest and best way, in my opinion, is to be aggressive with those exercises. Again, I didn't see any changes in posture, but I did see changes in symptoms. I was going to ask, um, one thing you talked about was dynamic MR, and you showed the posture of the patient in the static position with the scoliosis films. Is there any information about 
the effect of some of these deformity operations on the dynamic posture of the spine or gait after surgery? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you're getting at. You're you're saying well, the, the, it's one thing these, to stand there for an X-ray. It's another thing to walk down the hall. And sure, no, I, I don't. I know of no studies. You guys, know of any? Um, um, they, okay, there, there you go. Yeah, you got, you got some, that's going to do it. You got some work to do, but yeah. it's going to be really hard to get a dynamic study unless you're doing photography. Yeah, like somebody is just walking along yeah. beside them while they're walking. Yeah, so they can they can do that now with smartphones. I oh, enjoyed your lecture. It was fascinating. Uh, particularly, I was interested in the um, the case you showed of the cord signal changes without cord compression. And I've seen a number of those, and I have not gotten flexion, extension, or dynamic MRIs. Do I don't, the patient, do they have progressive myelopathy? Not progressive myelopathy, but they have their myelopathic on exam. Yeah. Okay. When I see them. So, you know, the question is. Maybe if we did an MRI and extension reflection and saw that there's tethering there, then because we couldn't figure out like where where is the damage? They never had uh, any major uh, trauma and there was no cord compression, but they had myomalacia changes. Yeah. So I I think you're you're good. You're, if you do dynamic studies, you're going to identify some patients yeah. and they benefit from surgery. Yeah. So that I didn't show didn't. Uh, um, highlight on that film where the, we got the flexion view later um, but he had a straight line compression let me yeah I think that was shown in your film <clears throat> I'm getting there there he is so this straight line here, um, I don't know that anybody has shown me what I think in old spine surgery lore was a post-laminectomy membrane. And I think if there is such a thing, that's it. <clears throat> so when he bends his spinal cord, his spine forward, he pulls that membrane and drapes the cord over the ventral osteophytes. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Mike Gomez, questions? Uh, yesterday we had a nice chat about um, counseling patients. I can talk pretty loud. Um, He's got a big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we talked about counseling patients who... Um, had uh, severe cervical canal stenosis with cord signal change. Um, I, I use the example of a 73-year-old psychiatrist who um, had a normal neurological exam. She could do tandem gait forward and back, no Romberg sign. Um, she had good uh, rapid alternating movements, but she had a subtle Hoffman's, she had multi-level cervical canal stenosis with some cord signal change. Um, and um, there's some surgeons who uh, will tell these patients, well, you know, listen, your risk of, of having a catastrophic spinal cord injury is really high and you got to do something about it. And, and you and I just, you know, we uh, didn't agree that that's the right way to counsel them. Can you uh, sort of go over how, how you counsel these patients and sort of um, calm them down? Okay, you mean what I the way I explained it? To yes, you? sir. Your yeah, the conversation you have with the patient. Okay, the first I thing I great. asked you is, would if you had this, would you have the surgery? And you said, no. no. That's right. So we should all go by whether we're religious or not, the golden rule, because it applies to every single one of us. But what I do, I play a little game. I say, let's it takes a couple of minutes. I just say, let's play a little game in thinking through this. And I say, first of all, nothing we do is risk-free. So you got to offload the liability as much as you can, because they could walk out of your office after this visit and slip on a banana peel and become a quad. Okay, that could happen. Um, and you want to be, be on record as saying, and sometimes it's good enough to say, when they sue you, it's good enough to say, I always say that. How do you know? Because I always do it that way. And that's why I've done it this way for 20 some odd years. But bottom line is 
I, I would say to the patient and family, um, let's assume that she's 70. Yes, sir. Okay. That uh, um, 70 year olds as a group have about a one out of 50,000 chance of having a spinal cord injury in their lifetime, just for whatever reason, car wrecks, falls, skiing, whatever. And I said, okay, um, what if the rate was, um, you know, we cut, cut that by 10, one out of 5,000, okay? So I doubt if there's a tenfold increase rate of risk, but even if there was, let's take it to a hundredfold greater risk uh, th than the general population in her age group. That's still one out of 500. And if you look at national databases, the incidence of catastrophe is about one out of three or 400 with, with spine surgery of that nature. Do you buy that? Is that a, is that a good game to play? No, I mean, I well, the same risk of death driving your car. Exactly. One in 7,000. Is what? One in 7,000 chance of death yeah, driving yeah. your car. Yeah. It's not the same. Did you hear that? Um, yeah, the risk of death per year driving your car is one in 7,000. Per year? Per year. So I would always tell the patients with radio surgery that the risk of a secondary malignancy is about two tenths at, of 1% in 20 years post treatment. And if you're worried about that, then you need to give me your car keys. Yeah. So, so that it's, it's interesting. We both have for different things, have different ways of explaining it to people. And they say, aha. Mm -hmm. So that, that patient was told she needed surgery, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So the surgeons that do that are using scare tactics. Right. Okay. And that it's, it's not drains my gears. Yeah. I'm surprised that there's not natural history studies of cervical spondylosis that might even document the incidence of catastrophic events related to trauma. Yeah, but it's hard to quantitate the extent of compression. There, there's a very high incidence of people with cervical degenerative disease and poor compression that are completely asymptomatic. Yeah. So it's, it's very hard to... Yeah, what Dr. Benzel is saying, it's, it's, it will be very hard to, to know. You know, you know what what that would be. I think it's like thirty percent of people. There there are some like good papers from the past that talk That's about that. Another study you can get going here. What, what's that? Looking at some at, degree of at asymptomatic at all and see papers. Yeah, see what happens. happens. Some degree of bad cervical spondylosis yes. or poor uh, compression. Where people with cervical stenosis, uh, they were all symptomatic, and they somehow followed the ones that, it, that reported that they had had a trauma in the past five years. And the incidence of spinal cord injury as a result was no different than the group that did not report a trauma. Of course, there's lots of, you know, factors there, but there's at least something in the literature that says like minor trauma is not going to lead to, um, you know, a spinal cord injury. And then as far as car accidents go, just tell patients, don't get into a car accident. process is the elderly patient with a c2 fracture yeah you know there's camps that think that you know you got to operate on these and other camps that say man you know the complication rate's so high um mm -hmm. so jason yeah what do you do you have commentary on the artificial disc stuff no i mean we were we were talking about it yesterday i think your your presentation's very appropriate because it's not something we think about in terms of the biomechanical loads because the papers that are out there that level one studies clinical trials show that there is decreased rates of adjacent segment disease in artificial disc at 10 year follow-up but you know like we talked about those papers are in general funded by industry um and uh you know there, there's bias involved as well but it's very interesting about the three percent uh, annual risk of adjacent segment disease with laminoframinotomy equivalent to that with ACDF. See, it's like these the people who did the studies for artificial discs totally ignored what we already knew because of the, well, how many studies did I show? Five, and they all basically so show the same thing. 
for, for the when you had mentioned going up to C2, is that only if you go down to the thoracic spine? Like if you had to do a three to seven whammy. What's that? You uh, there's an echo over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't hear so well. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. For you had mentioned going up to C2, don't stop at C3. Yes. Is that only for fusions that cross the cervical thoracic junction? For the most part, yes. Okay. Um, I mean, I'll do a three to six fusion frequently. Right. Um, so it's not, but I, I want to get them. I won't do them frequently, but I will do them. And I want to make sure that I get good alignment when I do that. And I want to make sure that the C23 disc angle is going to be relatively horizontal in the standing position. Thanks, Go ahead. Uh, bit. Go ahead. From a non-spine surgeon, you know, so I, you know, I very He's often... He's not a spine surgeon, but he spine. operates on spines. Yeah, yeah but, but <laughs> I'm, I'm not, you know, I very often do the posterior foramenotomy. And I just, you mentioned that. I, I, I think it's a great surgery. And I was just wondering what... You know, how would you, because I, I think for laterally uh, located disc uh, with clear nerve root compression, when there's not a lot of calcification, it's just a, a great surgery where you do through the tube with image guidance. And if you can't get the disc out, you do a foramenotomy, you might be doing just as much good. Yeah. So what is your like indication, like what were the patient that you would consider to well, do this procedure as opposed to like they, a CDF? They have central stenosis and, uh, and they have the clear cut foraminal stenosis. So interestingly about that operation, I don't know if it's that way now, but it, you know, 15, 20 years ago, it was very regional. Like in the Northeast, there was a lot of people doing uh, foramenotomies and in other parts of the country, everybody's doing ACDFs. Yeah. Um, so it's, it is a regional thing. The one operation though that I, I didn't talk about today is laminoplasty, which I am a huge fan of. Uh, for a lot of different reasons, it appears to, in the Gogolala study, to be leading the pack, leading the pack being, the pack being um, ACDFs and uh, cervical laminectomy with fusions um, and in three categories, uh, um, uh, return to OR, cost, and qual health-related quality of life metrics. Um, and so... Uh, I'm widening my indications, as are a couple of my partners with with uh, uh, laminoplasties, uh, for doing laminoplasties, and um, you know uh, I'm, we're we're seeing good results on it. And if you need to do another operation, you can still do either of those other two. You haven't burned a bridge. Although, I ha has anybody re-explored a laminoplasty here? No. I I found it to be just riddled with scar, you know, is very different. So you, you got to want to do it. It's easier to do an ACDF on top of it rather than a... Yeah. You mean post-op? Long-term? No long-term, but like if they present with a lot of neck pain, um, some some surgeons prefer not to do laminoplasty because of the the neck oh, you say pre op neck pain. pre op neck pain yeah I don't follow that rule okay but I want to ask um can I ask you a question sure um we did a young woman late thirties with an intradural extramedullary entirely ventral um, tumor from C2 to C7 looked like a giant pendomoma. It turned out to be schwannoma. Um, but when we did the surgical approach, we did unilateral pediculectomy, laminectomy and pediculectomy, okay. all the way down to C from C3 to C6. And then we cut this tumor into small pieces and yeah. literally pulled it out from one side. The patient... Uh, tolerated the operation, but post-op when she was fused, she ended up with a long skinny neck with severe muscle atrophy Okay, and committed suicide um, because okay. of her physical appearance. Um, well, why, why does she have a long skinny neck? Muscle atrophy. I'm not sure why. She was fused all the way, but I'm like from C2 yeah. to T1. Yeah. You know, like First the- of all, that's a a great approach. You could come at it from both sides too. Yeah. Um, 
but she looked like you know the the cultures Malaysia. I don't know which country it is where they band the neck. Yes, where okay. the neck doesn't stretch. It's actually muscle atrophy. That's what she looked like. Have you ever seen severe muscle atrophy? No, no. I I'll see it dorsally if you've over you know put a lot of tension on the muscles, erector spinae yeah. muscles during track you know traction injury basically yeah. ischemia. Yeah. All right. Well, we've gone through the lesson here. Dean Sendon from FIU Medical School is here and. Uh, some of his colleagues in biomedical engineering would have loved to have heard the biomechanics part because that's what Ed was really famous for, was taking us through all these calculations and lines and numbers and angles and everything. I, I had a, quite a few angles and things yeah. in this talk. Okay. That's why he was known as the engineer of spine surgery. But Ed, thank you for coming and thanks for a great talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, we have a small reception outside in the lobby, so please come and say hello, Dr. Benzel. Thank you.